If you think you're going to continue having deadlift personal bests, you will have artificial hips <laughs> and all of these other things. Because how many old powerlifters do you know? We have a lot to unpack here, so buckle up. Stuart McGill was recently on the Peter Tia podcast talking about back pain, deadlifts, and more. A lot of folks sent me this concerned and confused about things he said in it. For instance, so if you want to be a power lifter, try not to throughout the day do a lot of uh, bending versus the yoga master. Please stay away from the very heavy loads. I think it's important to share what research actually shows on these topics. As such, we've got two things to address from this podcast. Number one, are squats and deadlifts dangerous? And number two, is the McGill method the secret to limiting back pain? Let's get rolling. Firstly, are squats and deadlifts dangerous? Stuart McGill has done a lot of great research, but his advice and claims often get extended into information that he hasn't researched and is in direct conflict with what research actually shows. For example, this claim. And I'll say, what are your goals? Oh, I want to set a personal best in deadlift. Would you rather, as your goal, have the ability to play with your grandchildren on the floor when you're 80 and get off the floor and pick them up? And they pause for a minute and they'll say, yeah, I like that goal. I said, well, you can't have both. But he's never researched that. In contrast, there are a lot of high quality studies that have looked at this. For instance, the Lift More series. The Lift More trials have focused on using high intensity resistance training in the form of deadlifts, squats, and overhead presses, with individuals averaging in their 60s. The results are clear. Lifting is safe and beneficial. Participants have improved their bone mineral density, physical function, and functional mobility well, there have been virtually no adverse events. In particular, these studies have highlighted that lifting to a high intensity is important for having positive bone mineral adaptations. Now, it's important to pay attention to the protocols used, as these studies have been set up intelligently, having participants start with a lower load, getting familiar with the technique, then gradually progressing their weights when confidently capable and able to maintain their technique. And as you can see, doing this has paid off well for participants. Let's not stop there though. When you look at the incidence of injuries within lifting and most lifting sports, it's just not that high. Competitive weightlifting and powerlifting have an incidence of injury between 1 and 5.8 per 1,000 hours, which is low. If you compare that to soccer with 4 to 35 injuries per 1,000 hours, or to basketball with 24.7 injuries per 1,000 hours, or even to swimming, which has an incidence of 2.6 to 3 injuries per 1,000 hours, lifting doesn't look all that dangerous. Lifting is a relatively safe activity with a low injury risk. The risk only goes up if you do something dumb or push it to an extreme level, which applies to pretty much every activity. Don't just listen to me though. Go and scour the comments under the YouTube video where you'll see tons and tons of stories of people who have found so much benefit from doing these exercises. Now, before we move on, Stuart McGill made a specific comment about these lifts leading to hip replacements that I want to address. Let's go get any one of our colleagues who are orthopedic surgeons. Tell us who you're replacing the hips of. Well, 50-year-old uh, Caucasian women who have done yoga for 30 years, okay, uh, and uh, men around 50 who've uh, done deadlifts all their life. <laughs> This caught me off guard, as it's not been my experience, nor what I've seen in the research. So I reached out to my friend, Dr. Chris Rayner, who is an orthopedic surgeon and specializes in this area, asking him for his thoughts. He wrote a very detailed response, which I'll share here, and you can pause and read the whole thing if you'd like, but I want to highlight a particular section. I am an advocate of squatting and deadlifting in many of my patients, and I don't have patients avoid these exercises with the idea of preventing osteoarthritis of the hip. I believe that they are valuable tools within moderation to develop strength, mobility, and proprioception in most patients. Resistance training has so many benefits for individuals, particularly those in older age. Squats and deadlifts can be an excellent choice to help them improve their bone mineral density, muscle mass, functional mobility, and more. You don't have to do squats and deadlifts. There are tons of options out there, but squats and deadlifts aren't inherently dangerous. I think a problem arises where there's a disconnect in the advice and rationale behind it. Can deadlifts and squats lead to issues? Sure, but the same could be said of any exercise that's dosed poorly. If you're just getting into lifting, you should take time to learn the lifts. 
Stay within a right range that's relatively easy, and then gradually progress as you're confident. For those who would like even more information diving into the anatomy and mechanics of back injuries, particularly around lifting weights, I'll link an article I wrote for Stronger by Science that dives into this topic in great detail in the description. I want to make this clear. I'm not anti Stuart McGill. We're both Canadians. He seems like a really nice guy I'd love to sit down and have a beer with, but his advice is often not lined up with what research shows. All right, next up is the McGill method, the secret to back pain. <sighs> this is a huge topic. But before I jump into the research, I want to play a clip from the podcast and give credit to Stuart McGill. Everybody should be doing this. You don't wait till you have back pain to do this. Is that safe to say? No, that, 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 this is a, a bit of a myth and something that I've been fighting basically my whole career. Oh, McGill is the big, McGill Big Three. Going into the podcast, I assumed that he'd be a vocal advocate that everyone should be doing the McGill Big Three. But I was wrong. I've read most of his research, multiples of his books, and been around the industry a long time and I cannot recall him ever stating that people don't need to do them. So this was refreshing. Now, I don't want to skim through the podcast and try and debate every single point he made. He has merit in recommending his exercises, and I respect that he's taking a great deal of critical reasoning in determining them. However, I haven't seen research justify their utilization over other options. The research examining them shows no clinically meaningful difference in outcomes when comparing the McGill core stabilization approach to other interventions for back pain. This isn't surprising. The concept of core stability being the cause of back pain has been called into question for a long time. I'm not saying there aren't people who benefit from this approach. Back pain is complex, and there are a lot of contributing factors that can impact someone's pain in the moment, their pain in the short term, and their pain in the long term. I've used his approach in the short term with some patients and seen positive results. However, I don't explain it to them that their spine is unstable, or that they need to avoid certain ranges of motion or movements in the long term just that temporarily we're going to limit positions and motions that are bothersome. Whereas for lots of others, this isn't needed and they do well exploring motions and challenging these beliefs. I think it's important to highlight something. I've had a lot of people seek me out because they were either treated at his facility or by one of his students or by someone who followed his philosophy and they didn't improve, or they even got worse. And the clinicians were unwilling to modify in their approach. So this isn't to bash him or his system but to expand your mindset and consider other options. At the end of the day, for most patients experiencing low back pain, specific exercise choices are a small component of a comprehensive rehab approach. A discussion and focus on health, habits, and lifestyle often pays bigger dividends. All right, that's enough yammering. Hopefully this video was helpful and helped you understand things a bit more. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer. Thanks.